Thank you guys for coming out. I know there's many places you could have been having lunch, and thank you for choosing to have it with me. So about a week ago, last Thursday, almost a week ago, it was the 4th of July. In the morning of the 4th, everybody got up and they were planning, barbecuing, swimming, getting together with family and friends, what they were gonna eat, picnicking. And at 10.33 a.m., everybody's plans changed. No one had any control over what happened. A gigantic earthquake hit, everything started shaking. You couldn't run from it. You couldn't hide from it. You couldn't grab a legal brief and read about it. It was real time occurrence. And similar to that, on January the 1st, 2020, next year, the California Consumer Privacy Act will go into effect. And the same way you can get prepared for an earthquake, you can now start to get prepared for the new Privacy Act. And that's what we're going to talk about. This presentation today is designed to be in plain English. We're not going to get into all the minute technicalities of the law, but you're going to get a very good overview of it, a lot of code sections, and in the attachments and handouts that were included, everyone got the attachments and handouts? Well, um, the CHBA members got an email, oh. and the chamber members, I Got it. All right. Well, I included amendments and other you know, parts of the statute that would be very helpful for you. So let's get going. We're going to hold all questions to the end if you bear with me, and hopefully by that time, everything that you need to know will be answered. So as you can see, some of my ingredients, one of the reasons it was very appealing to me to come speak with the bar today is because I, before becoming an attorney, used to be an engineer, and also I used to be a business owner. So I understand what it's like to run a business, trying to make payroll, trying to do marketing, trying to manage employees, and at the same time trying to comply with the law and all these crazy laws that you're hearing about and figure out what's going on with having, having to run to your attorney every five seconds. So that's my background. Throughout the presentation today, I will use the term CCPA. CCPA is for the California Consumer Privacy Act. So I don't want to throw anyone off, but just you know, to move through it a lot quicker, we're going to talk about CCPA. Again, I have to read this. The seminar is intended to provide a general overview of the law. Advice should be sought about your specific circumstances. No attorney-client relationship is formed unless there is a signed agreement with my office. So let's get into it. We're talking about personal information. And all of the terms and words that you'll see have specific definitions. And we're going to go into those as we move forward. But in general, why should you care? You know, who cares? Why are we caring about this personal information? We always get personal information. We've been getting personal information. Well, now there's a heightened sense of awareness because of all the data breach events and all the other cyber incidents that we've had. And you don't want your company's name to be in the headlines if an event or a data breach occurs. So first and foremost, we care because we want to maintain our company's reputation. Because if your reputation is tarnished, consumers and customers might be less likely to do business with you or entrust you to their data. In addition, the likelihood of a data, of a data breach is increasing and is very high. Just this year, every month, there has been a major data breach of institutions that you may be aware with, of. For example, in January, Fortnite, a game that a lot of children play, they suffered a breach in which, and they get 80 million active users playing the game a month. In February, a dating app, Coffee Meets Bagel, acknowledged that they had a breach. In March, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Association under the government said that 2.5 million disaster victims' information was breached. In April, Microsoft email services acknowledged that they had a breach through a non-corporate email services. In May, WhatsApp said that people were able to spy on their, phone, their users' phones using their users' micro, microphones and cameras. In May, Anyone that's purchased property is familiar most likely with First American Title. They acknowledged through their financial group that there was a leak of 885 million personal and financial records. Just last month in June on the 10th, the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol Protection Agency said that images of travelers' faces and license plates were compromised. And then on the 11th, which I'm sure a lot of people use, Evite, said that 10 million users had their personal information put up for sale on the dark web. So what happens is, 
if there is a data breach and you're not prepared, now your company is dealing not only with the breach, but a crisis management situation in terms of how we're going to respond, manage, contain, and eliminate it. So this is an overview of where we're headed today. Talk about the origin of the law, the purpose, why are we concerned, why do we want to comply, who does CCPA apply to, what rights the CCPA provide to consumers, what is a consumer under the law, possible changes to CCPA, and complying with it in minimizing data breach exposure and fines. Brief history, November 2017, Mr. Mattaggart proposed the ballot initiative by, uh, by Rash soon after he proposed it, a lot of tech companies immediately opposed it and didn't want it, Facebook being one of the biggest ones. However, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal came out, they withdrew their opposition. May 2018, the group that Mr. Mattaggart was a part of, Californians for Consumer Privacy, announced they have enough signatures to put it on the ballot. The legislature was not in favor of that in Sacramento, so they immediately began considering it, and it got passed. And it's going into effect January the 1st, 2020. So if you look at the law, it's, it talks about what the legislative intent is. Why you know, do they want this law? And specifically, the legislature says that People, they want, because Californians have a right to know what personal information is collected about them. Whether that personal information is disclosed, who is it being disclosed to, you, the opportunity to say no, I don't want my personal information sold, the opportunity to access all of the personal information that you have on a consumer. And the last, which says equal service and price, it means non-discrimination. Meaning that if a consumer says, hey, don't sell my information, uh, you know, don't disclose it or what have you, you can't start charging them unfairly more money and other things, or you can't deny them service or goods because they're exercising their rights. So why, if there are a lot of portions of the law that are not settled, there's still a lot of amendments pending as to what's going to happen with the law, why be concerned with it? Why comply now? The reason is because likely a lot of the major provisions inside of the law are not going to change. And there are very big consequences if you get it wrong and you have a breach. Because the law, as we'll talk about, says you have to have implemented reasonable security measures. And nevertheless, the main portion of it goes into effect January the 1st. One thing, if there is an event or if a consumer says that something happened before they can sue, and private right of action means that a regular citizen can bring a lawsuit. California Attorney General also, their office can bring a lawsuit. But before a lawsuit can be brought, they do have the opportunity, a 30-day opportunity to fix it. It's called to cure it. So there is a 30-day opportunity to fix the problem. But if you look a little closer where it says private right of action, a consumer can sue a company or whoever is holding the personal information for between $100 and $750 per consumer, per incident, or actual damages, whichever is greater. Now, there is a little bit of dispute because some people feel, well, if there's multiple breaches of a consumer's uh, gender, preferences, buying patterns, things that are defined under the statute, that all groups into one lawsuit, one fine. Whereas some people say, no, it's a fee or a fine per item. So let's just do a little bit of math. Let's say that there was a data breach due to a company not having reasonable security measures and info from a consumer was sold on a dark web. One person purchases that person's bank account, someone else a credit card number, someone else the gender, someone else their geolocation data. As you can see, all of those fines can quickly add up. Now, even if they did add up, and I just listed to you four of them, you're still under $5,000, we'll all agree. Well, if you have a bunch of consumers, and let's say it even went, amounted to up to 10,000. Where could we bring that lawsuit? Small claims court. So in 30 days, they don't have to wait to go through all of the other paperwork. They're in small claims court filing the lawsuit. So this is just something to think about as to, you know, do you really want to be bothered or haggled because you're not prepared in small claims 
things of that nature. Because people do utilize a small claims court. It's only like a couple hundred dollars and you can get before a judge relatively quickly and they do have the, the power to enforce these. Also, the California Attorney General's Office can prosecute and it's $2,500 per violation if they choose to. However, if they find that your behavior was intentional or a company's behavior was intentional, it can be up to $7,500 per violation. So what exactly is a California resident under the CCPA? Again, it said consumer. So consumer means California resident. Anyone that's in the state and you're not here for a temporary or transitory purpose, you're a California resident. Someone that's in another state and you're just in another state for a temporary or transitory purpose, then you're also still a resident. Everyone else is a non-resident. So what businesses are impacted by CCPA? Almost all businesses worldwide. You know, companies worldwide have to comply if they collect or process consumers' personal information, do business in California, and we're gonna go into what it means to do business in California, and satisfy one of the following thresholds. Alone or in combination, annually buy, receive, for business commercial purposes, sell or share for commercial purposes, 50,000 consumers, households, or devices. In addition, annual gross revenue greater than 25 million, or you derive 50% or more of your annual revenues from selling consumers' personal information. We're gonna talk about what it means to sell because the definition might surprise you and again, we're gonna talk about what it means to do business in California. But let me just draw your attention to the first bullet point. When we get into personal information, the law defines it also as having a person's internet browsing activity. So you might not have 50,000 customers per se, but do you have 50,000 possible where you have geo tracking set up where you're tracking 50,000 different people? So you could easily surpass that threshold. And this is what we're getting into about the fact that personal information, the way it's defined, is interesting and broad. Think about it. Any information you have on someone that identifies, relates to, is capable of being associated with someone or could reasonably be linked to someone or their household qualifies as personal information. Next, here are some of the categories. There are 11 categories of personal information. The previous slide had the statute. And these are some things now that qualify as personal information. Your IP address telephone number, debit cards, protected class information, gender, race, sex, vein patterns, geolocation data, internet browsing activity, education information, unless it's protected by FERPA. And look at the last bullet point. Inferences drawn from a consumer's preferences, behavior, or intelligence. So as you can see, this is pretty broad. There are some exceptions. If the information is already publicly available, if it's de-identified information, aggregate information, or information disclosed for a business purpose. What is de-identified information? De-identified information means it's information that can't be reasonably identified, relate to, describe, or be capable of being associated with or linked directly or indirectly to a particular consumer. And a business has to take certain safeguards for it to qualify as de-identified, de such as you put technical safeguards that prohibit re-identification. The business has processes that prohibit the re-identification also, and you prevent the inadvertent release of de-identified information, and you make no attempt to re-identify the information. Aggregate Consumer information is information that relates to a group or a category of consumers from which individual consumers' identities have been removed and that is not linked or reasonably linkable to any consumer or household. 
including via a device, it's most likely a smartphone, something like that. The issue that I see in that when we're talking about these definitions is what does it mean, how can you determine whether information cannot reasonably be capable of being associated with a particular person, especially with all the advances in science where they can regroup and merge together disparate data elements. So that's one thing that we'll be struggling with. Also, what does it mean about a business purpose? It has to be reasonably necessary and proportionate to achieve the operational purpose for which it was collected. So how do you determine how far is too far when you're just using it for a business purpose? Some of the business purposes that they list are auditing related to a current interaction with a consumer, maybe counting ad impressions on Facebook or Instagram, detecting security incidents, debugging errors, and other uses similar. So now let's talk about collecting and selling personal information because that's one of the key things that we're talking about when we're talking about consumers' personal information. What does it mean to collect? Obviously, you're thinking buying the information or obtaining it, but look right here, it says accessing any personal information by any means. Receiving information actively, passively, or observing the consumer's behavior. So you're observing a consumer's behavior that comes into your business, you are collecting information. Let's talk about selling someone's information. Yeah, you can think logically renting it out, releasing it, disclosing it, but what about you're selling because you made it available, you transferred it, communicated it orally or in writing, or by other electronic means for, for, for monetary, or valuable consideration. What is valuable consideration? Because it's listed separately from monetary. Valuable consideration could be, I ex exchange information with you, and in response, you have an employee that works for you that has a large Instagram following, say something positive about my company. Because people pay media influencers. So that's valuable consideration or you pose next to my business, and I know your persona is known everywhere, so by the mere fact that you do that and you charge people to pose, that's valuable consideration. And therefore, if we have all that, then a sale may have occurred. There are some exceptions to collecting and selling personal information. For example, if the user directs you to do it to a third party because you're trying to facilitate a transaction, you know, the business is sharing it because the consumer is saying, hey, I want to opt out. I don't want my information sold. So you're just trying to go through the motions to carry that out. That would be an exception. And there's a few other that you'll see on the display. There are some companies that are excluded from CCPA scope. Companies that do not operate for profit or financial benefit, financial institutions regulated by the Graham Act, consumer reported agencies under FCRA, healthcare providers under HIPAA, and a company without a physical presence or affiliate in California can avoid complying if it can ensure that commercial conduct takes place wholly outside of California and they are not doing businesses in California. So yes, wholly outside of California, but what does it mean to not do business in California. Well, what does it mean to do business in California? We can find definitions for that in the California Revenue and Taxation Code, because I'm sure our franchise tax office has a way to figure out who's doing business in California so they can get their fair share. And also in the California Corporations Code. And they basically say if you actively engage in any transaction for the purpose of financial, pecuniary gain or profit, you're doing business. Also, if you enter into repeated and successive transactions in California. California residents, you're doing business in California. How could I be in New Hampshire or Florida or Idaho and I'm doing business in California? What if I have a website set up and I'm selling late night fitness equipment and I market to people in California and I have different specials and deals and I'm able to ship it there and they're buying it. Even though I'm not here, I'm repeatedly and successively because my website is up 24 hours a day. And people can access it and I advertise on TV on the late night infomercials. So am I doing business in California? 
Now, the law requires companies to have certain procedures and practices in place. The reason I bring this to your attention is because in the event of a data breach, it shifts the burden to the business to prove that you had reasonable security measures in place if something happens. How can you prove, well, what's reasonable? What's a reasonable security measure? Well, it's kind of hard to define, but we do have guidance from the 2016 California Attorney General's Office in which they put out their data breach report, and they talk about authoritative security standards that organizations should take which would constitute a baseline level of what reasonableness is. But other than that, that is a little vague. It's a little ambiguous. So now that we talked about what personal information is, we talked about how broad it is. We gave a little idea of the type of penalties and fines that are available if you don't protect it. We talked a little bit about what type of data security measures and technical measures you have to have in place. What exactly are the rights that consumers get? Yes, we, at the beginning we said they have a right to have their information protected, to have it not sold, but let's get more specific with this. The right to access data, consumers have the right to object to the sale of data. Excuse me. They have the right to opt out from having information sold. They have the right to opt in to having information sold for minors. And they have the right to receive services on equal terms, meaning they cannot be discriminated against for exercising their rights. Right to access data. Wednesday, January the 1st, 2020, John calls your company and says, I want to see all of my data that you've collected about me. What do you do? Is it, now one of the things as you can see here, it says, the law requires that at a minimum you have a toll-free number, and if you have a website, because you have to have two methods, if you have a website, you have some type of website address, email address, for people to reach you. So, do you think that it's safe to assume that a consumer that finds out about the new law is always gonna go through these, these two prescribed methods? or they're gonna scour your website, look for any phone number they can find, and say, hey, I want my data, if they can't find this. And if a consumer does do that, are you on notice that you have to turn over that information? Or you can say, well, you didn't call the 800 number, you didn't use the prescribed email, so until you do so, the time clock doesn't start. Because there is a time that you have to respond. So what that's called is you're creating a way to have a verifiable consumer request, because that's what it's called. They have to make a verifiable consumer request. Why verifiable? Because you don't want to get in trouble for just divulging someone's information to the wrong person, so you have to have something in place so you can verify it. Now, after you receive the verifiable request, if you collect personal information, there's certain requirements you have to divulge. If you sell it, then there's other requirements. So let's talk about those a little bit. So you collect personal information and the consumer asks for it. You have to let them know what specific pieces of information you've collected, the categories and sources from which the personal information was collected, what was the business purpose for you collecting it, and what categories of third parties, affiliates or other companies you work with that you've shared it with. Now, within your company, you have to have people there that will be responsible to respond to these requests and know what's going on. Because if they get it and they say, oh, we'll just deal with this later, or they give not complete information, technically you violated the statute and you're still at risk. Now, if your company sells consumers personal information, because you may just collect it, but let's say you collect and sell it. So if you sell it, you have to also give the customer, the consumer that's requesting it, the personal information you've collected, what categories, and the categories are based on those 11 categories that we talked about that you've sold, what categories of third parties to whom the information was sold, and what business purpose did you do it for? Now, there are some exceptions to this, because this can be overwhelming at times if people are just doing this. If you have a consumer that's just 
you know, requesting this excessively. And we'll talk about how often you have to keep responding to this. If the disclosure is going to affect the rights and freedoms of other people and things of that nature, then you don't have to be concerned with replying for stuff like that. Now, how do you respond to the consumer's request for data? This is what I was alluding to. Does everyone in your company know how to respond? First of all, you have to do so within 45 days. So you have 45 days to respond. However, you can get an extension up to 90 days by following certain requirements, letting the consumer know within the first 45 days, it's gonna take a little bit longer, and things of that nature. The consumer can do no more than two times in a 12-month period. So they can't ask you for more, the information more than twice in a 12-month period. So if you have Harry and he asks you for his information in January using your 800 number, and then in May he contacts you through the email address and asks you again, and then in November he contacts the IT department or someone else and says, I need my information again. Well, it has provisions in here where they don't have to do that. You don't have to comply for any more than twice in a year. However, who at your company is going to be monitoring these requests to ensure you're not just going along with it and wasting time providing all this information when you don't have to. Who's at the company is going to be monitoring and keeping all the information together in a write in a readable, usable format or in some type of email account or data file account so you can send that out when you have the request? Because you may have it, but if it's not organized, you're still in a bad situation. And also, does your company have the technical, technical capability set up so you can keep all this data? because this can easily you know, exceed your server space. The second right is the, a right to object to the sale of data. So immediately beginning January the 1st, 2020, you have to have a web link on the business's homepage that says, do not sell my personal information. It allows a consumer or a person authorized by the consumer to opt out of the sale of that personal information. You can't require a consumer to create an account just to carry this out. It has to be there. So on January the 2nd, Thursday, 2020, Mary comes to your company's website. She signs up for your special offers, for your coupons, for your newsletter, but she doesn't want her information sold. Is everything enabled to comply with the law? If not, we should start working on it. Another right, the right to be forgotten also called erasure. So consumers can request the erasure of any personal information. Friday, January the 3rd, 2020, Tim emails your company through the contact email address and says, erase all of my personal information. Who's gonna be responsible for notifying all of the divisions in the company to remove it? Who's gonna be responsible for notifying all the service providers, telling them to remove it? Who's going to be more, you know, this is the key question. Who's going to be responsible to go back and check to see that the work was done? Obviously, most of you guys probably have a vested interest, but are the people that work for you going to follow through? And how, what kind of safeguards are you going to have in place? You have to fulfill the request again within 45 days. However, there are some exceptions. If you're working on a transaction for someone and you need the data to facilitate the transaction for the purchase or whatever, you can keep the data. Because then, next thing they're saying, breach of contract, because you didn't finish complying with what they bought or sold. Or if you're providing a good that the consumer requested and you need it to deliver it or what have you, you know, you can keep the data. And there's various other, you know, reasons why you can keep it. The right to opt out. We kind of talked about it with the web link, but let's say a person has been doing business with you for a while and, um, for the sake of argument, let's say on January the 4th, annoying Aaron calls and says, although we have had a business relationship for several years, you know, I want you to stop selling my information. Okay. Then on January the 30th, Aaron calls back and says, well, you know what? I changed my mind. You can go ahead and sell my information again. So now you have to go back in and make the change. And the funny thing is, the law says consumers can exercise their right at any time. So is your company set up so that someone can easily subscribe, and I mean agree, to let stuff be sold and then change their mind back and forth? However, it puts the onus on the business owner 
Because if you want to ask them, hey, can I sell your information again, you have to wait at least 12 months before contacting them. So a consumer can go in and out at their, ple at their pleasure, kind of like the do not call registry. You can call the 800 number, get on the do not call registry, and then you buy something else, and then you don't read the terms and conditions, and you click the box, and you're pretty much getting called all over again. Right to opt in for minors. So we talked about opting out. So if you're a minor, envision Tina. She's five years old. Her parents take her to the toy store, buy her a doll. And nowadays, a lot of the dolls have functionality where they're linked in with cloud accounts. They allow you to store voices and do interactive things, or you can go online and create a storyline and things of that nature. And so Tina tells her parents, hey, I want to participate in all this. And so, that, so the website says, sure, just set up an account. And in the fine print, which is real fine, it says you agree to allow us to sell your data or what have you. So therefore, you're, the parents set it up, and now she's sharing and they're selling information. However, does your company have something in place to verify the identity? So it's not just the child logging on, setting it up. Because this applies to children under the age of 13. Does your, did, and then also, you know, what happens if you don't have that in place? Because if you don't, and you don't ask, and you're not trying to verify age, the law may deem that you are willfully disregarding the law. And willfully disregarding may mean that an intentional violation is subject you to higher penalties. So these are just things to keep in place. Right to receive services on equal terms, also called non-discrimination. So we talked about annoying errands just a minute ago and how if we got a whole bunch of annoying errands, we're, we're sick of annoying errands. You know, one minute you're, you want to play, you know, one minute you don't want to play, one minute it's okay, one minute it's not. So your company says, you know what, we're going to make a new policy after what we went through with Aaron in January, effective February or March the 1st, everyone knows if you do that, if you say it's okay, and then you revoke permission, and then you ask for it again, you're going to be charged more for our services. Well, that may put you in a position of now you're discriminating against people. So what are acts of discrimination? If you said, Aaron, we're not selling anything to you. We reserve the right to do business with who we want to do business with. We're not serving you anymore. Provide a different level of quality or quality of service. Well, you can't get everything. You know, you can get, you know, a Big Mac and fries, but your value meal doesn't include a drink. You know, we're not going to give you everything. You're not getting a dessert. Or you use unjust unreasonable, coercive, or usurious, usurious in nature financial incentives. However, if you come up with a way that it relates in a proportionate manner to what the reasonable cost incurred that you have to go through, then that's not unjust because we're talking about being unreasonable. So if the way that you're handling it, you're just charging a slight more for dealing with someone like that when they're you know, putting you through certain changes, then that may not qualify as being unreasonable. So what you, and let's see here. So this is what we're talking about, exceptions to non-discrimination, reasonably related. So what you want to do is you want to calculate it. So if in fact it cost an extra 50 or $100 to you know, do what you have to do to opt someone out or because they don't want to sell the information, then if you charge an extra $100, $50, if it's $100, you charge an extra $50 or something, or $15 for overhead, that's okay. If you charge an extra $1,000, likely that's not reasonable. Likely that's a little too much. So you have to think about it, and it depends on the industry that you're in because everyone's overhead and cost to comply are different. So those are the rights. Without question, there are ambiguities in the law. Amendments are still coming to the law. And the attorney general is going to be involved in it to help kind of smooth out the patterns. So what are, there are several ambiguities, and the legislature is aware of it. However, they're telling the courts, we know there's other laws out here to deal with privacy. We know there's a, a lot of vested interests. But just, you know, liberally construe to effectuate its purpose. 
meaning courts should exercise a lot of latitude, try to find a way to enforce the law, even if there are some ambiguities and some people go to court and businesses are there trying to fight it. And despite the ambiguities, because of all these different things that you have to put in place to comply with the rights, I strongly suggest that you start implementing or working on a way to implement it now rather than deal with the consequences of noncompliance. Amendments to the CCPA. Several amendments are currently being considered that will affect the CCPA. I've attached them to uh, the handouts. First of all is AB 25, and the gist of it is they're trying to exclude employees. You having to go through all of this for employees and people and job applicants and other people that are trying to just, you know, begin doing business or working for your company. So this is one amendment, AB 25. AB 846 deals with the non-discrimination right that we were just talking about. AB 873 is dealing with the de-identification issue in which we're talking about how it's kind of vague when you're saying reasonably linkable to a consumer. How can you figure that out? How can you know that some information that you got could be reasonably linked to a specific person or their household? AB 1281. This is interesting because we're talking about the facial technology software that's going on. And what's interesting is the fact that it's going to require businesses, if you use facial technology, to disclose that usage in a physical sign that is clear and conspicuous at the entrance of every location where you use it. The sign has to be displayed in a manner that ensures that an individual can read the sign before the digital image or video is captured of the person and that can be analyzed. And also, the sign has to include information where you can find out more information. It makes me feel like those Prop 64 signs that have all the text when you enter a building right by the entrance and it has a long list. Because think about it, if you have to put information on the sign as to where they can get this type of information, about the purposes, this is not like a little welcome sign we're talking about here. This is a pretty detailed sign if you wanna comply. Another amendment is um, expands data breach requirements by eliminating the words government issued identification, which is in the statute, and it, it kind of defines it for you. So what, what are they talking about when they're saying government issued identification? We're talking about tax ID numbers, passport numbers, military IDs, and other unique identifiers that are on government documents. Then we have AB 1202, where they're saying data brokers and this comes because of that threshold where some people just focus on selling personal data for money. So now they want data brokers to be, they define it and they want them to be registered with the Attorney General's office. Another interesting thing is AB 1395. And this deals with smart speakers. So if you have a recording or a transcription and it's retained through voice recognition on a TV or any other smart speaker device, if the recording qualifies as a personal identification based on those categories we went over, and it's not de-identified, then it cannot be used for advertising purposes, shared with a third party, or retained in any location other than the connected television or smart speaker device that's under the control of the user. Why is this important? We talked about the breach with WhatsApp and how they use microphones and the speakers and everything on the, that phone that enabled that breach. The Attorney General's role in the CCPA. We kind of discussed some of the ambiguities and uncertainties as to how we're gonna deal with it. So they are supposed to be promulgating regulations in terms of how we're gonna implement this and coming up with all the necessary things so everyone can further the purposes of the law. This includes the categories of personal information because we talked about making inferences from someone's intelligence or buying patterns. Can you imagine being at court and there's someone is saying, well, you derived information from my intelligence and therefore you breached and you didn't share it and you didn't let me know and things of that nature and you breached the law and now you're trying to defend yourself. Um, definition of terms and other exemptions and compliance and rules and procedures for following the CCPA. 
So how can you comply now with the CP CPA? I wanna give you some specific things to think about in terms of how you can start complying and putting things in order. So when we're talking about data privacy assessment, we're talking about taking a global look at your company and figuring out where you are now and where you need to be. Personal data inventory, identifying all the personal information that makes a person, you know, whether you get it directly or indirectly or observing the person, as we talked about under this law, what do you observe? What are your employees and people observing when they enter your place of business and other common identifiers that you pick up on? Privacy policies and procedures. You're gonna have to update your privacy policy so it complies with the CCPA. Before, when consumers in the past, and before GDPR, when consumers wanted a privacy policy, you know, we can talk a little bit about your business, maybe have about a 30 minute, 45 minute conversation. I take a look at your website and in a vacuum, prepare the privacy policy. But now, since everyone has to be involved, since this involves the technical department, the IT department, other people that get data, we all have, to, it's more of a collaborative approach. That's why it's more comprehensive. So I strongly advise you not to get sucked into any friends or colleagues that you meet that claim to be Google attorneys and tell you we'll just grab a privacy policy off someone else's website and upload it to our website because they could be missing crucial things that you need that focus just on your business. But now it's not so much just the policy, it's what procedures do you have in place because as we talked earlier, you could have all the best written policies, a nice book bound by FedEx or Kinko's or whatever, and if no one's following it and no one's trained in it, what, what use is it? Privacy and security enhancements. Do you have a cyber incident response plan to deal with malware, to deal with hacking? Maybe an employee opens up their Gmail or some other mail that they get on the work computer or on their own device that you've given them to use. Now it's shut down your information. How are you gonna to respond to it? Do you have, have you done a data protection impact assessment to further flush all of these little things out before they happen? Did you put in place technology requirements for the privacy and security controls? I gave you some ideas as to you want to have the technology available to store that information for 12 months. Because when a consumer contacts you, if you have that information, they have a right to request up to the, lab, the previous preceding 12 months of data. So do you have the server space? Can you readily access it? Do you have it in a way where you can give it to the user in a portable format if they request it like that? Or if they have an account with you online, you can hit a button or go through a few steps and send it to us, or is it gonna be an onerous task every time you get this request? So you wanna put those things in place. And that gets into the company file management plan. How are you gonna to respond to it? How are you gonna be able to search for the data? Because you have to be able to break that data down by those 11 categories that are in the statute. You can't just say, here's all the data, it all relates to all the statutes and think that you've complied with it. Implementation of the privacy and security. As I said before, you could have the X, the most perfect plan in place, but if it's not implemented, then you still haven't accomplished the goal of the law. And then even after you've implemented it, has it been tested? And that's called a penetration test, where you're doing like a mock breach situation. So you're pretending there's a breach and you're going through all the protocol, making sure that the appropriate employee or staff members at your company know how to respond, know who to respond to, make sure that they only respond to verifiable consumer requests and not cause a further problem by sharing information that they, with people that they shouldn't have shared it with and things of that nature. And then once you run the test, you can go back and fix any problems that you have. Also, I always advise people to ensure that they have cyber insurance and know that you, what you're selecting that you're getting the proper coverage because if you have a data breach event, there are laws in, a, in place in every state in the country, I think every state now in the country, where you have to respond in a certain manner. In California, for example, uh, if you have over 500 people who are affected, you have to notify the Attorney General's office. So there's a bunch of different laws and you want to have the cyber insurance to cover your fees and cost that deal with that. Because otherwise that's a lot of money you're paying out of pocket. And then lastly, the service provider agreements. You want to review 
all the agreements that you have in place with other people to make sure that they're not doing things with the data that you shared it with. So yes, you shared some information. Let's say, for example, you're a plumbing company and you share the contact information of the plumbers with another agency that calls and handles the routing for people or does your scheduling. You use a third party and they have a breach. Do they have all the controls in place to protect you and to comply with the CCPA? Because if not, you're still at risk. So in terms of minimizing data breach and exposure and fines, but one thing we can do as a baseline is at least implement some of the recommendations that the Attorney General's office came out with in 2016. This included things such as having inventory and control of your hardware assets, of your software assets, continuous vulnerability management, controlled use of administrative privileges. Do you have control, controlled use of those privileges? Especially when people have BYOD, bring your own device to work. Well, I can check my email, I can log into our accounts from my smartphone, from my tablet, things of that nature. How are you controlling that? Do you have firewalls in place? Um, do you have malware defenses? Do you maintain it? Are you working off of software that was effective for the latest malware attacks in 2017 and now we're almost in 2020? So are you updating it as you need to do? And um, are you controlling who has access to what? Meaning that only individuals that absolutely need certain data can access it or can anyone, as long as they're an employee and they work at your company, they can access the data. Because one of the things that's interesting about this law is it talks about the fact that anyone that comes in contact with the consumer private information, personal information, has to know what to do and how to handle it. So it can't be, oh, well, that's just the IT department. Oh, well, that's just the head manager. Anyone that comes in contact with it, the onus is on them to follow the rules. Um, let's see here. So, these are other services that I provide. My office, we do look into trademark infringement, copyright infringement, trade secret misappropriation, cyber squatting when people are taking your domain name or and sitting on it, things of that nature, wrongful diversion of internet traffic. And believe it or not, a lot of these things come up because when you have a breach or you're leading up to a breach, people start maybe trying to take your logo and divert traffic to their website or try to imitate you and things of that nature and then it opens up the door for a plethora of problems like that. So are there any questions and answers? Again, I try to dumb this down as much as possible in this short time that I have. Yes, sir. Um, I can add to, you can change your status of giving out your information or withholding your information. How many times in a 12 year period and a 12 month period can they do that? They say it at any time, I believe. Because my, my fear is that you may get somebody who says, well, let's see, I told them not to, now they told them to, I told them not to, but they did it, so they, they breached my, my information, I'm going to sue them. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what is the risk on that? Yeah, they can exercise their right at any time. That, that's what it says. So in other words, and a company can't say, well, uh, you know, we change your status twice already, we're gonna, can, we charge, can they charge them to change the status a third time, we'll say, within 12 months? Well, it, it's it, not about discrimination, it's about wasting the company's time. Exactly, and it said you can charge if it's reasonable and not unjust. So that's why I was saying if it's related to, you know, the actual administrative overhead, yeah. so then... Yeah, that you can do. Yeah. Okay. I have one other also. You mentioned uh, cyber insurance for what, what happens here, but every state has its own rules. Can you, be in, can you infringe in 50 states? Yeah, you can have a... Well, Rules concerning, I'm talking about a data breach in terms of how you have to respond to a data breach. Okay. So, in, for example, in California, as I was saying, if more than 500 people are affected, you have to notify the attorney general's office. Right. That's not standard in every state. Other states may have the threshold higher or lower or things of that nature. So when you have a situation, you know, it's going to cost money and time to comply with each state's rules where someone was affected. So that's so if you have cyber insurance, it can help defray the cost or cover them. So the insurance is actually, if you, if you are accused of being breached in 50 states, it can put you out of business. Yeah, it could. Control. So the insurance theoretically can defray I'd some say of that. only theoretically dealing with insurance companies, 
uh, may may cover some of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just following up on that, and I also have other questions. Um, what if there's a uh, what do you call ransomware attack? Yes. Uh, so the data hasn't left your site. They haven't left your site. Yes. But um, you can't fulfill your obligation of providing personal information to people mm -hmm. uh, from within the, the last year. What do you think the um, value of that uh, would be held to be? What do you think courts would say? See, if you sue for not being able to yes. get your personal information, how much do you think the courts would give you uh, or your class? Well, you know, for Does there, not being able to sure. Personal Does everyone know what a ransomware attack is? For anyone that doesn't know, a ransomware attack is, let's say someone at your company opens up an email that they shouldn't be opening because they're supposed to be doing work, and uh, you get a block on the screen and a time clock, a countdown timer, and it starts counting down and it says, pay us, I don't know, $100,000, $50,000, some other currency in Bitcoin within a certain period of time, Otherwise, we're locking out all of your data, we're keeping it, and there's nothing that you could do. It's all encrypted, it's too bad. And it's just sitting there, like just torturing you, because you're just looking at the time just going down. So, a whole lot of cities, hospitals, there was a hospital out here, they, they started doing things by paper, because they didn't want to pay for a while, stuff like that. Most people end up succumbing to it and paying it. So I think that that would probably be something that the Attorney General's office is gonna have to work out. Now, if you couldn't get the data to someone immediately, you do have 45 days. However, the law has provisions in there where you can get extensions up to 90 days. So most likely, being that they're being flexible, you know, most likely the Attorney General's office would help flesh that out. Also, there's a provision in the law that says if you are a business and you have questions, you can contact the Attorney General's office for guidance on how to comply with the law. Just imagine you have to add that cost to your uh, ransomware insurance, which you probably should have. Yes. Uh, um, so, Here's a question from the beginning. Um, you know, you have statutory damages, but uh, it's probably better to pursue a case as a class action. There's so the option. question is, how can you find the class if the business is not supposed to release personal data? Well, you know, people find all kinds of ways to find the class. So if you feel you've been subject to it, an incident, you know, people may take out, I've seen now they'll do it on commercials, on Facebook, on Instagram, things like that. Have you been affected? Have you been affected? And, and people have been affected that want some compensation. I'm sure they'll likely respond. Is there a provision that requires companies to disclose their customer lists in camera uh, in, a, in a private court setting for the protective order so that lawyers can find potential I didn't see that. I haven't seen that in the statute. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Hold on just a minute. Were there any other questions? Yes. And I'll get you. I'll come back. Yes, Typical small offer. So I'm looking at your page 10, business impacted by CEPA. Uh, you have to satisfy one of the three. One of the three. Yes. Okay, so annual gross revenue of 25 million, I wish. You don't. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. All right. 50%. We don't sell information, so that doesn't. So the question is the first one. Mm -hmm. And you have the idea of personal information, which is reasonably required to function. Mm -hmm. You obviously collect personal information from clients. That's right. But that's because you need that information to function. So under those circumstances, would that law firm be outside the category of an impacted company? No, not necessarily. Because when we went through the definition of personal information, it also gets into the fact of IP addresses and internet browsing activity. So if you have... You well, could, I, yeah, I mean, you could, but... I, I'm saying the typical information that you get in dealing with a client with yes. their litigation or their business transactions, mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess it could be some of those, but mostly it's going to be things like telephone numbers, race, sex, products purchased, things like that. Yeah. And that's going to be in the context 
of what you're doing for them. That's right. So hopefully, and and, and, and you got fifty thousand. So now I suppose you could have some of that from the other side. Whether that would be business purpose, because you know information about your opponent, mm -hmm. uh, and that might impact the fifty thousand. Yeah. But it would seem to me that a smaller law firm may not <coughs> be within this category. Yeah, we hope. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, right. Yes. Sir. That's kind of what I was going for. They're mostly going for the, the bigger, medium and bigger size fish. Uh, yeah. The Facebooks and all that. And I also saw that nonprofit uh, organizations are exempted. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not. Involved. Unless it's a for profit. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't uh, say non. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That helps. Yes, sir. When you are a consultant, an independent consultant for a large company, and you have a website that's generated through the company, are they responsible or are you responsible? What do you mean a website generated through the company? Um, okay. I, I'm a side of American consultant. Yeah. Both parties. They're responsible, obviously. But they're the ones that actually build and update the they're responsible for updating the website even though mine is But but is it your website that you control? Oh, if everyone could please quiet down just a little please. I control it in that um, there's options I can have on it, like offers or specials or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they are responsible for updating the website and maintaining it. Yeah, I would have to look. Because I don't want to just say yes or no, because it makes me think of the like when I talked about third parties and we're sharing data with different people, and so we want to be very specific about that. Okay. Somebody else? Yes, sir. So, what about business managers who have all kinds of personal data by their clients because you know, we're basically paying all their bills and whatnot? Mm -hmm. We're dealing also with vendors. You know, we may have to call the plumber to go to their house. That's right. So, we're it sounds like we're impacted by this, or we have to make sure that the plumbers and all the people we're dealing with are in compliance with this. And yeah, you want them to have the necessary controls in place because they're like your service provider, right. as it talks about under the law. So you could do everything in your power, and then if they're not being diligent, they're putting you at risk. How do we, I mean, so are we basically supposed to be then going to them and saying, all right, you're a service provider, and we think you're covered. You come under this law, you need to assure us that you're following these these things? Well, when you have, for example, if you just think about a basic independent contractor agreement, and as this company A, which is the larger corporation, you have an independent contractor, it, in my mind it's synonymous to having like a indemnification clause in which you, I, you agree that your employees, that you're an independent contractor, you'll secure workers' comp insurance for your people, things of that nature, and you're going to follow all applicable state and federal rules, same thing. So you would want to have those agreements in place because you can't monitor them, but if you have indemnification and other clauses in place, then therefore, they, you know, that it puts the onus on you because even if you did monitor them, even if they agreed to do it, let's say they fell off and they didn't respond, then you still could be, you know, dragged into something. So you want, so, and if you are, I'm indemnified and you're going to pay whatever fees that cost me because of your failure to comply with the law. Yeah, but sometimes it's not, you know. I know, but I'm just. I mean, <laughs> the client's calling you and saying my house alarm is going off and I don't know how to shut it off. Send the guy out here and okay, okay, maybe we have an agreement with ADP, but if it's a leak, you know, and the plumber, we're, yeah. we're not going to have him sign that independent contractor agreement. I mean, it may be a one-off kind of thing. And and how many businesses do that all the time? But if it's an emergency, right. if you're on the side of the road and your vehicle's broke down, you're not going to say, hey. You know, do you guys? <laughs> you comply with yeah, you know, I mean, you know, we have to be practical with certain. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Let me just. Yes, ma'am. Um, I belong to ISSA, an information security group, and a lot of people don't know that they're actually being caused by this brink your own data policy. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just always seems to me that the more you use it, the more you have to use it. Mm -hmm. Device, what we do, but um, it's also too as a consumer, I do not want my information being taken out of the office 
on someone's device that they have all their personal and their wife and their kids yes. and um, God knows who else and they might lose it. And, you know, the wife yep. and the kids are not necessarily good people and your girlfriend or whatever. Um, so I just, I just think, and that has come up. I yes. mean, it's not that hard to carry two devices, but I just, for me, I don't want... You know, you leave it in the office, and I don't need you to answer me, uh, you know, on the weekend or every single thing, but if you do, then, and it only should be the very few people that need it. It doesn't need to be. Every administrative assistant is, is and I've seen this happen, and I, I do a uh, county um, um, with paralegal, and um, I mean, people are, are the administrative system does not need their emails on their uh, device. Besides, there's labor law issues yeah. regarding that. And I know myself, I do some work right now for a company. I log in. I don't even download. Um, yes. Why would you uh, do that? So that's just causing a whole lot of um, breaches and a lot of problems. They're saying, do not do that. Have separate devices. No, and she has a very valid point because a lot of the major breaches have come from people leaving a laptop in the car, leaving a phone device ex um, exposed somewhere. Or what do you do if the employee quits? <laughs> you think they're going to come back in and say, well, you know, I'm going to give you two and a half weeks notice and allow you to go through my phone and delete what you feel you should delete and say what you feel you should save and I'll email it to you and, you know. So I have time for one more question. How about two quick yes no questions. <laughs> One, um, if it's a malicious employee uh, who releases the information, uh, does that get you the uh, $7,500 damages that the AG can uh, but, but, do for intentional breaches? So intentional. Uh, I, I don't know if I can give you like a yes no to that because it depends. Intentional is, you know, it, it gets into were you on notice? Did you understand? Had you been known something that, like that was going on? So I don't know if we can just make a blanket and say it's intentional. And the other thing is, can a corporation be considered a uh, California resident and a consumer for the purpose of seeking damages under this act? Uh, the California consumer? I don't know about that part. The California resident? Possibly. <coughs> Possibly. So I don't know. It, I, don't know I don't have to think about that. All right, well, I want to thank everyone for coming. I really appreciate your attention and time. And uh, if I could be of any assistance to you, I have some business cards right up here in the front. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.